Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Howard Reed and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Pulmonary Hypertension at Janssen. I'm honored to be your host for today's program, Assessing Risk in Patients with Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension, Clinical Strategies and Considerations, sponsored by the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. This program is intended for U.S. healthcare professionals only and is not certified for continuing medical education. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, is a rare disease caused by elevated pressure in the pulmonary arteries, which may lead to right heart failure and death. Despite recent advancements in our scientific understanding of PAH and the availability of targeted therapies, PAH remains a relentlessly progressive disease with a poor prognosis. One of the overall treatment goals for patients with PAH is to achieve and maintain a low risk status, meaning the patient's estimated risk of dying within one year is less than 5%. A low risk status has been associated with better outcomes in patients with PAH, though it may not always be achievable in patients with certain etiologies and comorbidities. As such, today's program is focused on the importance of regular risk assessment in patients with PAH and the tools that are available to support risk assessment in clinical practice. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our guest for this discussion, Dr. John McConnell, who is the medical director for the Norton Healthcare Pulmonary Hypertension Program. Please note that Dr. McConnell is a paid consultant for Janssen. If you have any questions for Dr. McConnell during this discussion, please feel free to submit them using our Q&A feature. Now, Dr. McConnell, thank you for being here today. Could you tell us a little more about your work and areas of interest in PAH? Thank you very much, Howard. It's a great honor to be here with this group and to tell you that it's very important that I think it's a thing near and dear to my heart about pulmonary hypertension patients. I've been doing this for many years before there was any treatment for pulmonary hypertension. Back when lung transplant came along, that was our only thing we could do for patients with pH. And the weight allocation system was at that time, it was nearly impossible for a patient to get a, a lung transplant. And it's only been up from there once we had oral agents. So we have treated a large number of patients at our center for many, many years and have a very historical perspective. That's what the gray hair means, I guess. Um, right now, I'm in practice in Louisville, Kentucky. And with Norton Healthcare, we have about 250 group one patients that we follow. We're involved in a lot of research. Uh, every drug really about that there is that's out there now for pulmonary hypertension, except IV eproprostanol is a study we've been in in the past. So we've had a great opportunity to participate in a lot of things going on. And uh, I've learned a lot from my patients. And I have to say, it's a passion for me, pulmonary hypertension. And I think I can't wait to talk more about it. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dr. McConnell. It's really an honor to have you here uh, for this discussion. Uh, now let's jump in. Um, can you start by sharing your perspective on the role of risk assessment in PAH management and how it can help inform patient care? And as a reminder, branch treatments and patient information should not be discussed during this program. I think that pulmonary hypertension risk assessment is important because pulmonary hypertension is a rare disease. And you don't see it a lot. I think that risk assessments helps people to, who don't have a lot of experience look at the right data. I think that uh, it's a progressive disease. We know that every patient with pulmonary hypertension will progress over time. And that's the kind of thing that makes you are concerned about your patients. You say, okay, we're going to go from here as good as we can today, and we're going to get worse over time. So what can I do to try to change this? And over the years, we saw patients and said, oh, you look good today, and that's where you are today. And we felt like it was always hard to understand where people were going to be down the road and not be able to say, okay, this is the answer. This is where you're going to be. And always the patient's first question is, am I going to live? How long am I going to live? And without the right tools like risk assessment, you really cannot answer those questions. Those kind of questions are very important to patients. And I always tell them, this is a group, this is not you as an individual, but we know there are certain things we can do to try to make it so that you will live longer and live better. Yeah, it's such a great point. And, you know, it's, it's common for physicians to apply their clinical judgment, also known as Gestalt, when evaluating a patient's risk status. This can include a variety of parameters, including age, gender, comorbidities, and results from a physical exam. 
How do you incorporate clinical gestalt into your assessment of the patient's risk? Are there any limitations we should be aware of? Well, I think that gestalt is the old way. <laughs> I mean, that's what we did forever before we had good tools and good information. Uh, you think about in the past, that's all we had. Um, we didn't have risk calculators back then because a lot of patients had not been cataloged or at least incorporated in large databases. Like the Reveal Registry has 3,500 patients. And those patients' characteristics were cataloged. And over time, we were able to work out risk. In, in the Europe, European theater, they have their own risk calculators based on different patient populations. But when you talk about Gestalt, when you see a patient, what you're saying is, okay, you look good today. Well, today is where you were right up until the moment you saw me. And if we want to know where the patient's going to be in six months to a year, we have to have information and be well informed about where what characteristics of patients are going to tell us that answer. And I think that if you, there's a study published in circulation in 2020 that did a retrospective study on the gestalt of the provider and then where the patient ended up using a risk calculator. Hmm. And they were wrong about a third of the time, about a third of the patients they said were, were at low risk were intermediate. And about a third of the patients they said were intermediate were really high risk. And we care about high risk because in a high risk category, we're expecting statistically a 20% mortality over 12 months. And that's a really scary thing to think that I'm just going to go on what I think rather than more objective tools. And I know we in the past have always used data, which is for sure, but which part of that data is the most important and how are we going to put it in? And I think that none of us are so smart that we can really say that this is the answer without some scientific input into what's going on. So I think that risk of assessment needs to be tied in to our practice from the very beginning when we see patients and really at every visit. And I think that that will help us in the future make better choices for our patients. And remember, this is a high mortality disease. And a lot of young people, about half the people are young women. And I think that those things should put it at the top of our mind because here we are dealing with a group of young women. Some have children, some have don't, but they all have families and they're important to their families. And how can we make sure that in a year, or in two years or three years. I mean, we have moved the bar as far as survival goes with pulmonary hypertension with great medications uh, done by research with companies like Janssen, but we're not there. And I don't think anybody can say we're there. So I think from here on out, we should always use the best scientific information we have. And I think risk assessment is that method. Yeah. Dr. McConnell, you mentioned the, the importance of getting in the practice of using risk calculators or objective tools, what are some of the available tools for PAH risk assessment and, and which tools do you use most frequently in your day-to-day -day practice? Well, there are a lot of tools out there, at least they're too big that I think are really well recognized. And there are the Reveal Registry or the Reveal Calculator. The Reveal Calculator had a large number of parameters. I think in that study, we ended in, in put, put like 64 data points on each patient periodically to come up with the calculation. But now that we have Reveal 2.0 and Reveal Light, which gives good information that things that you have in your hand when the patient comes to the office, so you can make a calculation then. Also, there are is the European uh, society, uh, European Society for Cardiology and the European Respiratory Society's risk calculator. And that calculator has been determined using four European databases. And those databases have been used for a while. And those databases will help us in a different patient populations. It's just a new, a new thing. And I don't know if we're at this point yet, but we can talk about the new guidelines from Europe if you want, or we can put that off a minute. Yeah, let's let's put that one off a little bit. I love to. You mentioned um, reveal 2.0 and reveal light too, and I'd love to dive a little bit deeper. Um, and as you know, Dr. McConnell, ten years ago, Janssen sponsored reveal, a multi-center observational U.S. registry of more than three thousand patients, which catalyzed the creation of these tools. 
Can you tell us about your experience with using these tools and the benefits they may bring to care teams? And, and first, please note that reveal risk assessment calculators were internally validated by investigations, sponsored, funded by Janssen. These tools cannot replace, of course, clinical judgment or decision-making by a qualified healthcare provider. Well, I think that using the risk calculator has made us better at our jobs. I think that it tells us sometimes when we see a patient, oh, wait a minute, you look good today, but uh, this number is not so good. You put it in the calculator, you're not low risk anymore. And the goal for all of our patients is to get them in a low risk status. Whether you use Reveal or the European is to get into a low risk status. And I think that getting there, you're not gonna know to get there unless you know where you are to start with. And I, in our practice, every patient at the time of diagnosis gets the Reveal 2.0 risk calculator done. And that sort of informs us about where we are as far as where patients going as far as the risk for mortality over the next year. If they're low risk, it's five or less. It goes up with each uh, intermediate and high risk. So we want to get people all to the low risk status. In doing so, we are able to make choices about medications. And when patients return, we're able to see what their progress has been. What we want to see is we'll see a patient at diagnosis and start treatment. And over the next three months and then six months and 12 months, nine months, we'll see what the risk calculator does. And if the risk calculator is going the right direction, we know we're on the right track. If it's not there, we don't. We think, well, we need to make some intervention. And I think that it drives us. I mean, you can see a patient and they are feeling better in the office because you've given them a good medication and their functional class has gotten better. So in their mind, they're great. And they're going to tell you they're great. Oh, but when you do something like a six-minute walk, it's not so great. They don't walk quite as far as they should. Or they you draw blood and their BMP is still high. And that just tells you that looks are deceiving in this and gestalt is not the right road in this patient population. We need to use our risk calculator. Yeah, it's great. It really does speak to the importance of objective risk assessment in the management of patients. Now, now Dr. McConnell, going back a little bit to um, your point around the guidelines, I'd love to uh, go there here for a moment. And as you know, the European Society of Cardiology and European Registry Society recently published its 2022 guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of pulmonary hypertension, which included updated recommendations on PAH risk assessment. In your opinion, what were some of the most notable updates to the risk assessment guidelines and how could they influence patient care going forward? Well, I think that there, one thing that I'll bring up right now that's not part of the risk assessment is in their guidelines, they have altered the definition that we have used from the World Health Organization. And it's very clear in that I don't want people to be confused by what they say. In their recommendations, they re recommend that we define pulmonary hypertension as a pulmonary capillary wedge of 15 or less, a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 20 or greater, and a pulmonary vascular resistance of 2.0. The World Health Organization in the past has always used 3.0, and this is a, a deviation from what we've done in the past. But if people read carefully, don't stop at that. If you read through the entire several hundred pages of guidelines that they publish, you'll see that they don't recommend any treatment for patients with the 2.0, really, because there's no data that shows treatment with patients with a pulmonary death resistance or who performed at 2.0 makes a difference. And there are no approved drugs for that category. And I want people to take home that message because I gave a talk the other day in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and those astute doctors down there in private practice said, look, the definition's changed. And I said, you're right, the treatment has not changed, even by the European guidelines. The European guidelines had a risk calculator in the past based on the four large um, registries that they have in Europe, the French and the Scandinavian and so what they did is they used this to look at parameters in each of those four and combine them to come up with a risk calculator. In the past, they used low, intermediate, and high risk for patients to try to determine how outcomes are going to be. And what they found is when they looked at their data, they were classifying 60 to 70% of all patients in the intermediate group. 
And there's a big difference in the intermediate group about outcomes. Some of the people are intermediate, but they're on the low side. Some are intermediate and they're on their high side. So in their new guidelines, they recommend looking at patients and classifying them as low risk, intermediate low risk, intermediate high risk, and high risk. That way they can divide up this large number of 67% of the patients to determine which patients have a higher risk than the other group. So in this new determination, they have calculated that the mortality in the intermediate high risk would be nine to 20% a year. The high risk is 20%. And the intermediate is five, intermediate low is five to nine. So they have come up with a stratification there that will help us probably better understand which patients need a lot more therapy and which patients need a little more therapy and hopefully better predict where things are coming from. I would say, though, that when we talk about the European registries, they're different than the U.S. registries, and they're based on a population in Europe where all the pulmonary hypertension care is centralized because of their healthcare system and patients are taken care of only in centers. And so that really affects what the outcomes are in these patients. Patients taken care of in an expert center are really totally different than patients who are taken care of anyplace else. And a lot of patients in the U.S. are not in that. And when you look at the European registries, they have a lot more men in them than the U.S. registries. If you really break it down, they have a higher percentage of men in their registries, and that may skew the data a little bit uh, because in the U.S., we have about 80% of people in the reveal registry were female. And so that's going to cause some difference in how we see things. And I think that, you know, there's no wrong risk calculator at this point in time. We want everybody to use a risk calculator. But I think that when we start talking about the people we take care of, we ought to consider using a risk calculator that's based on the patients that we take care of and our patients, as far as Reveal go, were the patients that we were taking care of here. We were one of the sites for Reveal, and it was a very robust endeavor that really brought no money to Janssen other than increase the knowledge, which was really a very nice thing. Um, and I think that we all learned a lot. All the experts in pulmonary hypertension learned a lot. We learned that 50%, even in our expert centers, were not getting a prostacyclin before they died. And that told us gestalt is no good <laughs> because our gestalt was always, these patients don't need this therapy. <laughs> and that told us, even in our expert centers, that's not the truth. And if we don't use all the tools in the toolbox, we're doing our patients a very big disservice. And so escalation of therapy at the right time has to be guided by something. And I think that the more we can move toward doing it in a systematic way and really sort of a national way to collect data in the long run, uh, I think that is something that is uh, going to move our knowledge forward. We moved our long way with Reveal, and the Europeans moved a long way with their registries. And I think that we still have way to go to get to where we need to be in improving patient survival. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McConnell. Such great points, especially around the importance of, of risk assessment and some of the differences uh, between Europe and the U.S. Um, but I want to I want to maybe turn the conversation a little bit to talk about Practically, how can we help people um, implement this into their into their day to day and into their practice? And in a recent online survey of 121 U.S. healthcare professionals who make treatment decisions, 41% reported that they do not use any formal tools to assess pH risk status in their patients. And a significant majority of these HCPs, nearly 90%, reported again relying on Gestalt when assessing risk. With those insights in mind, can you share your perspective on these existing barriers to implementing risk assessment tools in day-to-day -day patient care, and also how you can overcome those barriers in your own clinical practice? Um, and, and I also do want to remind the audience, uh, if you'd like to send in a question, please use our Q&A feature, uh, and we'll address questions at the end of the program. Well, I can tell you, risk assessment is a real pain when a patient's in clinic, 
I'm only an hour behind, which is average for me. And I think that it takes commitment on your team. I am very lucky. I have a great team that I work with, with nurse practitioners and medical assistants and pharmacists and nurses. And they, uh, I always say they make me look very good because they are so good at what they do. Uh, and they keep me honest. Some days when we get behind, I'm saying, oh, well, do we need to do this? And they say, yes. Sometimes they say, we're too far behind. We can't do this. It just doesn't fit into the day. But I have to say, anything you can invest in risk assessment and improving your patient's outcomes is worth the time. And We'll save you time in the future. If we think about it, just being behind is not a good excuse. Uh, I always tell patients, you know, I'm late, but this is your time. We'll spend as long as you want to deal with your issues. And that means, you know, you've waited, so it's your turn and people can wait for you. But I think that uh, the time we have today to see a patient enter anything, everything into EMR and get things going is a big barrier. And also to having the right data having all the data that goes into the reveal. We use the reveal 2.0 and reveal light in our clinic. At time of diagnosis, everybody gets a reveal 2.0 risk assessment. And then on follow-ups, they get the reveal light. And then once a year again, we'll do another reveal 2.0. And I think that getting all the data together is really important and knowing where it is in the medical record and keeping up with, the other hard thing is keeping up with, okay, did they have a walk? When did they have a walk? Let's look at, oh, that reminds me, you haven't had a walk. You need a walk. That incorporates it into my practice and keeps me honest. Oh, echo. Oh, BNP. You got your labs. Yes, we have that information. And um, renal function. Renal function is important to know where patients are. So all the data that we need, number one, it keeps us, reminds us, oh, we better order what we need to order to follow patients properly. And we need to put it in an organized fashion. So when we have, see a patient in clinic, uh, we have a risk calculator embedded into our EMR. Uh, thanks to Janssen with their help, we actually had uh, software installed uh, with their code that they gave us to our IS people, to IT people that we would um, get it into Epic, which is really important. And I think that has made us a lot better at it and saved me a lot of time and made me have no excuses. Uh, and our IT department, I met with the director of IT and he said, oh yeah, you know, time, IT always, how much time and how much money we can do anything, right? Well, it wasn't bad at all. I mean, I think it took our IT person about six, seven hours to get it all in because the code was sent from Janssen to them and something I don't know anything about. I don't know anything about computer code, but smarter people than myself were able to get it in. And now that it's embedded in the system, we did a few tests to make sure it was working. And now when patients come, we have that option in a flow sheet and we can put it in. And it really changes a lot of times to what we're planning. Uh, I can see the patient and we do the risk calculation. And then we have to say, oh, okay, well, this means that we're going to do more today than we thought we were. And I think that that is really where we are as far as all this goes right now, as far as getting to what the patients need. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's great how you started uh, the answer to that question uh, with your team. Uh, we all know the importance of the team and the management of these patients, and would love if you could share examples of how your team successfully works together to conduct risk assessments and build patient care plans. And at a high level, do you think risk assessment can help encourage more collaborative PAH care teams? Oh, without a doubt, I can tell you that. Many times we'll see a patient, we saw a patient the other day and she was doing okay. She had no complaints, right? She'd been waiting in the waiting room a long time. She had to go somewhere. <laughs> and so no complaints. Uh, but I said, you know, we really need to do a walk on you. I haven't had a walk in a while. And they said, okay, well, I don't have my walking shoes on. Well, we're going to do a walk today anyway. And that's always tell the patients, always wear your walking shoes to my clinic because you're going to have to walk. Uh, not every time, but be prepared. So um, the patient did their walk test. And even though they said they were fine, their walk had dropped about 40 meters. And when I started talking to the nurse practitioners and seeing the patients, I say, okay, when you examine them, did you see anything that you can account for this drop in 40 meters? Okay, well, maybe it was 4th of July or Christmas and they had some country ham and they were a little bit swollen and 
you know, their fluid status is up and maybe that might be affecting their right heart function a little bit. And uh, we have a give and take about, okay, what do you see that you think might help us? And I say what I think might be causing this. And a lot of times you'll find that patients will talk to providers and tell different providers different things. And I think it helps to have more than one person talking to the patient. And it also really helps to have a family in the room. I always require that the families come in with my patients with pulmonary hypertension so that the patient can tell me what they think and the family members sitting behind them going, no, no, they're lying. You know, they're quiet. They're, you know. And then I let the family member talk after the patient has had their say. And I learn a lot from that. And I think that um, occasionally, sometimes a patient's family will stop the nurse practitioner in the hall and have a little sidebar with them. Say, okay, well, they're really having trouble with this or that. And they're not going to tell you, I know. So I think that that team effort, but after we get everything together, there are a lot of times I'll turn to the nurse practitioner and say, okay, what do you think? I'm on the fence about this. What do you think about uh, what's going on? And I'm very lucky because my nurse practitioners have been uh, in the clinic. They've been working with me for 17 years in pulmonary hypertension. Not everyone is so lucky. I am the luckiest man in the world. So um, I'm just very lucky. And we can work together. Uh, and our team, we have a person who just does drug approval. And we're very lucky to have that. Our institution supports it because it's time consuming. And patients getting their drugs is really important. And they'll talk to me and they're very happy. But then they're going to say to me, can I talk to Sally? Because I need to talk to her about my mess. <laughs> and I think that is a really, it's a good thing. But it we all work together in the same direction. And that helps us know when things are going on. Because again, the patients will tell the person helping with the medication allocation things that they don't tell me. And I think that team approach and knowing what's going on with the patient better informs you because I think that we really have to get the risk assessment down, but also each one is an individual and we don't substitute our risk assessment for what's going on in the patient's life right now. And I think that really helps me know better on how to take care of my patients. Yeah, that's great. And you, you mentioned the build guides a little bit earlier in the conversation, Dr. McConnell, and the, that's one of the resources we're really proud to offer to care teams in the PH community. Um, we know that it provides step-by-step -step instructions to help healthcare organizations integrate Reveal 2.0 and Reveal Light 2 risk scores within their EHR systems. And our hope is that these guides will ultimately help reduce the burden on healthcare professionals at the front, at the forefront of PAH care and make it easier to integrate structured risk score tools into their daily practices. Now, I know that you, you've used it, but how do you think this type of resource could reduce barriers to risk assessment if implemented by care teams? I think it is an invaluable resource. Before, you could do it on paper. You could never find it in the medical record. You didn't know where it was. And, oh, did you forget your calculator? Do you have your little pad today? Do you have your app that isn't working? I think that all those things that we used to use in the past to come up with risk assessment it can be tossed out now. I think having it embedded in the medical record uh, and that calculator is you don't have to think. I plug the numbers in and answer the questions. And that has, I can tell you, Jansen's software update for our um, site has improved the quality of the care our patients are getting because no one goes out without a risk assessment, unless they came two days ago. Then they might go out today without one. <laughs> we had this discussion last week. Okay, they were just here Friday, and it's Tuesday. Do we have to do it? Well, probably not today, but uh, in two weeks, we're going to do it again. And most of the time, we're doing it to try to see if the therapy is really working and see if we're moving our patients toward that low-risk status, because we know if we can get them to low-risk status, that one-year mortality is going to be less than 5%. And if we're in high risk status, we know it's going to be more than 20. And so it helps move it. But I think having it in the system, and everybody hates their EMR. They really do. And I, I know that it's the worst thing in the world for me to transition from one to the other. And I've done it. And I think that having that tool uh, is just fabulous. It just, it just really makes our day as being able to get that done. Yeah, that's great. And um, for anyone that's interested, you can learn more and download the EHR Build Guides at www.pahriskassessment.com. Now, Dr. McConnell, um, as a final question before we go into uh, Q&A, what advice do you have for clinicians who want to be more intentional about incorporating structured, regular risk assessment 
into their practices or encourage its adoption across their institutions? Well, first, remember that the patient is number one. And everything that we do in our daily work should make it so that the patient is number one. And as long as you put the patient first, you will, in the long run, end up where you need to be. And putting the patient first means sometimes doing things that aren't so easy. Taking the time out to contact Janssen, which I would recommend because they are quite willing to help you. And after they help you, you have a contact number. You can get in touch with the people. And then having the taking the time to talk with your IT people. And I'd go to the top. The people at the bottom aren't going to help on this because the people at the top allocate the time and the money used to incorporate this. And it takes a little selling because everybody in your institution is going to want IT to do something for them. There are all these enhancements they want. They want this and that. And, and IT only has a certain amount of time. And I, when I met with our IT person, I had told them the importance of the risk calculator. I have told them that it's going to improve patient quality care. I told them that Jansen was written the code and it's going to be easier than they thought. <laughs> and that all rolled into something, but that wasn't the end of the conversation because they're all busy. And so after a month, no word, no word, contact them. Oh yeah, no, we have you on our schedule. Okay. Another month contact. No, no, no. We're, you know, so it takes follow-up on my part and it will take follow-up on your part is getting this embedded into your EMR. Don't give up. I mean, as we say, and if they say no, in my book, no is the beginning of the conversation. It's not the end. They need, you had to take the time to make them understand how important it is and how special this patient population is. So once those two things are done and they get it back to you, then you have to stress in your clinic to every person who works there, the importance of this risk assessment. To the lab person who's drawing the blood and getting our results for BMP. Oh, well, we lost it. Well, we got to get it, you know, if we're, to make sure that people know that a walk is important. Make sure that they know every time a patient comes, you're going to do a functional class. Every element of the reveal calculator is at your fingertips that can be found in the clinic. And that's what you ought to use to help you guide their care. So I would say once you get it embedded into your EMR, take the time to spend time and educate the people that you work with the importance of it and how it's going to improve patient outcomes. Because our goal is live longer and live better. And I think that as long as you get together with your team, and everybody has a team, and I'm luckier because I have the best team in the country, maybe the world, uh, but I haven't been to many places outside the U.S. I can't say that. But I think that we need to make sure that we all work together and they all work together to understand why we're doing what we're doing. And it's not, oh, this is just something I have to do. This is gets the result and make sure everybody's informed on your team about the importance. Yeah, that's great advice, Dr. McConnell. And before we start Q&A, are there any key takeaways or final thoughts you'd like to share on PAH risk assessment? Do it, do it, do it. I think that uh, if you're not doing risk assessment, you have an opportunity to improve your patient's care. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. And there are tools out there now and they're free. So uh, all it takes is your time. And every person who's a provider for patients always wants to do the best. They all want to be the best. That's the great thing about being in medicine. Everybody wants to outdo everybody else and be the best. And don't, if you're not doing this risk assessment, you're not being the best. I don't care if you've been doing this as long as I have since before time when there was no treatment. Gestalt isn't the answer. It's been proven in studies that Gestalt is today. And if we say you look, if Gestalt is your fine, that's looking where you were until you came to see me. If we want to know where you're going to be in three months, six months, and a year, we do a risk calculator because we know you did fine up until now. We got to figure out how you're going to do in the future because that's going to inform you as a provider to be able to alter treatment or keep treatment the same or plan ahead for the patient and help them know where, where they're going and what's going on. I see patients from time to time who need to change their living situation because of their health. And you may be, and they ask me, well, what does it look like? How am I going to do it? Without a risk calculator, you really can't help them in that regard. So I would say if you have, if you don't have the tool, 
get it embedded in your EMR. Once you get it embedded in your, in your EMR and make the commitment to your patient that you are going to give them the best care possible. And that means doing risk assessment when you see the patient and redoing risk assessment to know how your therapy is going. And if patients are not meeting their goal, and our goal, remember, is low risk status, do something then. Do something to try to get their risk status from high to intermediate and intermediate to low. And sometimes we can't. We know that this is a progressive disease. And sometimes, no matter every therapy we throw at a patient, we don't have the answer. Maybe that's the time to think about transplant. Don't put that off. That may inform you if you get started down the transplant road sooner than later, because a lot of times patients, since I do lung transplant as a side gig, I uh, see patients and, oh, should have come six months ago. Well, that doesn't mean we're not going to try, but the longer you wait and getting a high-risk patient into that system, the worse they're going to do. And I think that moving toward better health for these patients is a big job, and it takes a team. And it takes good data. And that's what your risk assessment and risk calculator is going to do. In the end of the day, it will help you get patients to where they want to go. And and as a sidebar, when a patient has two very expensive drugs and they're not doing well and their risk score is not improving or it's going up, that's the time to explain to the patient, oh, this is why we want to do this. Your risk is increased. And we know with this increased risk, you're not going to do as well over time. And this is why I want to add a new expensive medicine that's going to cause side effects and you won't like me for a little while. And then you'll live longer and you'll do better in the long run. So having that conversation with the patient for them to help understand why you're making changes in their therapy can help in the long run about getting acceptance and buy-in from patients to do all the hard things we ask them to do that aren't easy. Yeah, Dr. McConnell, um, those are such great insights. And on behalf of Jansen and the entire audience, we want to thank you again for your time um, and and your insights today. Um, It's really a gift with all your experience to hear from you. Um, I'd love to open it up for some Q&A. So if you have a question, uh, please put it into the Q&A function here on the webinar. Um, And I'm going to start, Dr. McConnell, with our first question. So what steps can we take to better communicate with patients about risk assessment and create urgency for regular follow-ups? Well, I actually do a lot of education with patients when they're first diagnosed. We give them a booklet put out by the Pulmonary Hypertension Association to educate them on the disease process, the pathophysiology, and medications, and sort of what to expect over time. When they come in, I usually talk to them about Okay, you read some of this. Oh, no, I didn't read. Okay, please read this. And when you come back, I tell them, write your questions in this book. Bring it back and we can go over what things you don't understand. Have your family read it. And I think for PH patients, family understanding that patients are really ill because they look good. They don't have any bad things looking out on the outside, but they have really bad problems on the inside. And it may help patients' families understand through education about why they need to have caregivers and what's going on with that. I think that when we talk about where patients are, that helps the patients understand and gives them hope. A lot of patients look online as soon as they're diagnosed and they think they're dead. (laughs) And they come in and say, how long before I plan my funeral? And the answer is, oh, we got a long time for that. We got a lot of things we can do for you. And educating the patients about these things, but also spending time educating patients about what to look for and also educating them about why we do this test. Oh, I don't like to walk. You know, I have a patient who's like 75 and she wears the nicest high heels ever. And she's always color coordinated with everything she wears. But I explained to her when she comes to walk, we'll get better results if she wears flats. So she brings a little bag, wears her high heels in. 78 and puts on her tennis shoes and does her six minute walk. And her understanding the importance of the walk really helped get that information. Patients always complain, I don't want to have my blood drawn, but explaining to them, this is information we use to help guide our therapy is really good. And getting them to sort of keep up with their symptoms. That's one thing I always try to tell patients, pay attention to your symptoms. Because when you come, I'm going to ask you, are you able to do the same things? Are you able to get down the street? Uh, are you able to walk a block? Are you able to get up the stairs? And let them know that those are things that I use to try to help guide their therapy. 
and make them understand the importance of all that. I think when the patient and the healthcare providers work as a team, we always get better results. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. McConnell. Now we have, um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, this one is, is uh, a little long, so bear with me, but I think it's a really important question to get your perspective on. So the, the question is, I'm still not understanding why reveal calculators would still be an option for follow-up therapy changes. Even if we use reveal light two, rather than the ESC ERS four tier calculator for our US patients, because the reveal calculators use U.S. populations for validation, we still need to align our follow-up treatments to the recommendations of the ESC ERS guidelines, which is based on their four-tier calculator. So why use reveal calculators anymore since they don't align to, align to the guideline-based therapy changes at follow-up? How can reveal calculators be used to understand what to do with therapy, at follow-up, given the calculators are not for tier risk models? Well, I would say this, the reveal calculator is based, and we base our treatment on the World Health Organization guidelines. And that is a bigger body. It's not just for Europe, it's the whole world, and it has different inputs. And if you use a reveal calculator, you will still be in line with the guidelines for the World Health Organization. And that's going to meet again in 24. And we're going to come up with new treatment guidelines. If you read all of the European guidelines, they're not much different than what was done in Nice in 2000. I forgot what year it is. So, you know, the last World Health Organization meeting we had there. They're not much different at all. Uh, there are some nuances and you have to remember a lot of these things are based on European experience. And our patients in Europe, the patients in Europe are taking care of an expert center. And there's a difference in an expert center and a U.S. community center, a regional center. And those nuances are not always, in, not always available to people having to take care of a lot of patients. I think that centralized care changes the European outcomes, and it also changes their database. And as I pointed out, in the European uh, registries that this is based on, they have a lot of men in their registry. And that's not the European, that's not the U.S. patient population. And I think you should use the one that works. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use a European, and there's nothing wrong with using European as long as you use one. I think there are a lot of people in the U.S., I mean, I was just at the Tufts Symposium, and there was a wonderful thing from the people who wrote the guidelines in Europe and the reveal people here, and they had a head-to-head -head, uh, back and forth about why mine's better and why yours better, and I think we're biased because we're the U.S., uh, and we really felt like that the U.S. presenters about reveal were good. Uh, they actually pointed out a lot of statistical things that I'm not going to go into now that seems to make reveal superior as opposed to um, the European. Uh, and I'd say European is good. If you're gonna do, I would do European before I do nothing. Uh, you're not gonna have that embedded in your EMR. And if you don't have it embedded in your EMR, how often are you gonna do it? If you're doing it every time you see a patient and to make changes, good, just do it. But risk calculation needs to be done. I'm biased because I was in part of reveal and there are statistical things that show that we're going to change things over time. Um, but you can see the Europeans just made a change uh, in their intermediate low and intermediate high based on new data. But that was only 4,000 patients, and that was a conglomerate. But every risk calculator has to be validated. And I don't see that their new one has only been validated once. The reveal has been validated over and over and over again. So that's my bias. Thank I you. hope I answered your question. <laughs> I think so. Thank you for your perspective on that, Dr. McConnell. Um, we have another question coming in, a really interesting question about the future uh, of PAH treatment. So looking ahead, what are your hopes for the PAH treatment paradigm and how do you see risk assessment shaping the treatment landscape? That's a really good question. And I think that when we're doing studies now, all new study design, we're talking about putting in patients who are higher risk. 
And why are we talking about putting in patients who are higher risk? Because what we want to do is have shorter trials. And you're more likely to have a, an outcome if the patients have a higher risk uh, in the trial. So if you start off, the, the trouble we have nowadays is most patients are on two or three drugs. And when you have a drug that you want to show a change in outcomes, it's hard if you're already on really good therapy to begin with. And the trials in the past have been very long. Some of the trials we've done have been four years. And that's a, and then you have to add two on the FDA and that and two on the other side to get developed. So we're talking about six or eight years to get a trial and to get a drug to market uh, for patients to, to get. And I think when we look down the road, we are really looking at trying to figure out what the risk our patients are to start with and to try to get patients who we think we can make a difference in into the trial. The other thing people have talked about is having historical controls, which is not always the easiest thing to have historical controls because our care has changed over time. But I think that's one thing. And if we look down the road, what we'd like to see are drugs that are easy to use and have disease modifying. That's what we call disease modifying changes, not just the vasodilators that we have and the anti-inflammatories, but how can we stop progression or can we reverse progression? And I think that most of the drugs that we're in trials with right now are drugs that can do the, well, potentially can do those things. We're not there yet, but we have some promising players out there. And I think that if we can move the bar to get to the point where we are disease modifying our patients and treating symptoms at the same time, we'll be where we need to be. But we're involved in a lot of phase two, which is early trials. And we've done a lot of them and some of them pan out and some of them don't, but we still need to move that bar forward. When we look down the road, there are good drugs out there and there are pathways that we haven't tapped. And I think that getting there and also studies we're doing sometimes now to try to improve side effects, profiles in patients are coming up a new way to deliver drugs. That's great. Thank you for sharing your perspective, Dr. McConnell. And in conclusion, first off, I want to thank you again. I thought this was fantastic, uh, extremely insightful. We want to thank everyone in the audience for joining this important discussion on PAH risk assessment and to continue learning about the insights and resources discussed today. Please visit www.pahriskassessment.com. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.